no, that's that, that, that's good. Um, we, we kicked off this morning with a really great session on what's new for REF uh, 2028. And this is now our inaugural lecture for the uh, Festival of Research and Knowledge Exchange. And it gives me really great pleasure to welcome Professor Marcus Munafo, who is Professor of uh, Biological Psychology at Bristol University and also the uh, uh, Associate Pro Vice Chancellor for uh, Research Culture. I uh, got to know Marcus a few years ago at my previous institution because Marcus is one of the founding members of the uh, UK Reproducibility Network, which is basically a, an association of, of scholars with a mission to uh, improve trustworthiness and reproducibility in science. So it's, it's a hugely important topic and Marcus and I, we touched base again and I invited him to come along today to talk partly about um, trustworthiness and research reproducibility, but also some of the other exciting stuff uh, he and the uh, uh, network have been doing around research culture. So I won't take up any more time and hand over to Marcus. I was getting some feedback from the other microphone. So thank you for that very kind introduction. And actually what I would say is that although the UK Reproducibility Network started out very much in a kind of biomedical and life sciences core, we're working hard to be relevant across as broad a range of disciplines as possible at the moment. So I'll make a start and if we get more feedback, I'll turn myself off again. Uh, transparency, trustworthiness and research culture. Um, I'm going to talk about how the UK Reproducibility Network came about and the ways in which I think that is relevant to um, current conversations around research culture. I start with this quote because I think it's a helpful one. I come from a psychology background. Most of the issues that I'll be talking about stem from the fact that academics, researchers, scholars, however well intentioned they are, however hard they're trying to do good work that is impartial, disinterested and so on, we're all human. And humans bring with them a range of cognitive biases. That's the day job of psychologists to understand those cognitive biases. This is one quote that I think captures that quite nicely. Scientists may be in the business of laughing at their predecessors, but owing to an array of human mental dispositions, um, few realise that someone will laugh at their beliefs in the disappointingly near future. This person who wrote this is Nicholas Taleb. He's not um, a scientist, he's not an academic. He's written about our difficulty, that um, the difficulty that we have when it comes to understanding randomness and probability. His first book is Fooled by Randomness. He's better known for Black Swan, but I think Fooled by Randomness is a better book. But the point is that as humans, we bring cognitive biases to our work and that shapes how we interpret what we see in front of us and the conclusions that we draw from our data, from our source materials. Oops, too many. So this is an example of that that I always use to illustrate that point of how we see things through a lens. These are three photographs of a geological feature on the surface of Mars taken by orbiting satellites at three different time points. It's the same feature. The first one looks like a face. People got very excited about this. That can't be chance, surely, because what are the odds? And we haven't sent anyone to Mars, so that must be evidence of intelligent extraterrestrial life. In fairness, not many people thought that, but it is striking that it looks so much like a face, except that it doesn't actually. That finding didn't replicate. When you take a photograph um, at a subsequent time point, it doesn't look anything like a face. It was a trick of the light, compounded by our tendency to see pattern in noise, and further compounded by our tendency to see faces in things. People see faces in clouds, in rocks, and all sorts of things. So those cognitive biases can shape how we see things in ways that can very easily lead us astray if we're not careful. And so when we go into our research motivated, interested in our subject, excited to find out something new, those cognitive biases can trip us up unless we're very careful. So that's one of the reasons why I think psychologists in particular have been very interested in these issues of reproducibility, research quality, and how we can be sure we get to a robust answer over the last few years. And there's another factor at play here, which is perhaps closer to the issue of research culture, 
which is the incentive structures that we work within. And this quote from a survey that's quite old now, again, I think captures that quite nicely. Certain features of the working environment of science may have unexpected and potentially detrimental effects on the ethical dimensions of scientists' work. And they, here they don't mean ethical dimensions in the context of people actively trying to defraud the system, for example. That does happen, but one would hope that that's rare. Rather, it's the extent to which the pressures that we work within to get grants to publish and so on can distort, can shape our behavior in ways that fundamentally and ultimately are not in the interests of ourselves, of science, of what we do. So those two compound mechanisms, if you like, conspire to create a situation where we can very easily be led astray, we can be generating outputs that are perhaps not as robust as we might like them to be. Our own cognitive biases that we bring just by virtue of being human, and the fact that, again, by virtue of being human, our behavior is shaped unconsciously by the incentive structures that we work with it. And what that creates is this spectrum of behavior. This is a nice cartoon by the blogger Neuroskeptic, borrowing from Dante's Inferno. And you can see that there is this range of behavior from the relatively benign all the way through to down in level nine of this academic inferno um, in the icy jaws of Satan, outright fraud. And many of these behaviors are so normative, so commonplace that we often don't even see or regard them as problematic. Overly enthusiastically interrogating our data, retrofitting our um, results, our hypotheses rather to fit our results. Something like 95% of findings in psychology or studies in psychology claim to have found what the researchers were looking for in the first place. And anyone who's done any research ever knows that you don't get 95% of your experiments to work. That's simply not how it works. And yet that's what the literature looks like. So the problem we have is that in the context of scientific research, we have a scientific method and we mustn't be too nihilistic. We're still making progress. We're still making advances. But the reality on the ground is somewhat removed from the ideal scientific method. And in part, that's because many of the things that allow science to self-correct need to be done in order for science to self-correct. And that includes things like running replication studies, publishing all of our results, not just the ones that look interesting or exciting, and perhaps most crucially, admitting that we're wrong, which is not something that, again, being human comes naturally to us because it's difficult to admit you're wrong. How often have you had an argument where at the end of it, you said, actually, I've been wrong all these years. I'm really glad you pointed that out to me. That's just not human nature. It's a hard thing to do. And it's just as hard for academics to do. And you see that when you go to any conference and you see people arguing over the same data, but they interpret it in a different way. They have their own position and it's difficult to move from that position because we're invested in it. And in fact, if you think about how we incentivize early career researchers, the advice that we give them, we say to people, become known for this thing. You know, you need to have your thing that you're known for. But of course, what that does is encourage you to paint yourself into a corner. Because if you build your career on the back of a particular finding that is your finding and has your name associated with it, it's really hard after 10, 20 years to admit that actually maybe that was a, a blind alley because your name has become associated with that edifice of knowledge that you've created. So why is this relevant to these issues of trustworthiness and transparency? This paper, written by some psychologists, again, a few years ago, I think illustrates this nicely. Some of you will be familiar with this, so apologies if you are. But even if you are, I suspect you may not have focused on what I think is the key message here. So in this study, the researchers collected real data where they randomized people to listen to When I'm 64 by the Beatles or another type of music. And they found that people who were randomized to listen to When I'm 64 became younger. It's not that they felt younger, you turn back the arrow of time, they lost a year of life. That would be great if it was true. I could just listen to when I'm 64 and not worry about getting old. Clearly, it's a false finding. The first point that was made here was that if you build enough flexibility into the design, conduct and analysis of your study, you can generate a small p-value on ostensibly robust finding that is actually completely false. And that's easy to do. That much is straightforward, I think. What to me was a, I think, more concerning illustration was that you then have a choice as the researcher to present what you did in full, which is shown here in this abstract, where you lay bare all of that flexibility in the design conduct analysis of your study that gives the reader 
a proper sense of how you arrived at your conclusion and the extent to which that particular focal test result that you're reporting is one of many that you conducted and then selected to report. Or if you wanted to, you could pre present a curated redacted version, which is shown in bold, which is more intended to persuade the reader that you found something exciting than it is to inform the reader in full of everything that you've done. And we have a choice which to present as the author. And the problem is that the incentives that exist would nudge us towards presenting the compact version that's more convincing, if you like, because that's the kind of thing that will get us into journals, get us into a certain kind of journal, into the kind of journal that we're rewarded for publishing in. And the key thing from our perspective as the reader is that we've no way of knowing which version we're reading. We rely on trust in the individual author or authors to have given us a full account of everything that they've done, but the incentives that exist push them in the opposite direction. So how do we know when we're reading a journal abstract where the result is less obviously clearly false, whether or not we're getting a full account of everything that they did, or only reading a partial account that is intended to get that work into a particular journal. And I think that that in part stems from our underlying culture, which can be traced, if you like, back to the 19th century of the independent scholar, that a certain type of person goes into academia who does it for the love of the job, who is typically independently wealthy, who doesn't do it for the money, and therefore we can trust them because they come from a certain social background. I'm not sure that was ever true, to be honest. People have been fiddling data as long as there's been data. But that's the conceit, if you like, that permeates our underlying culture, that we can trust people. And, you know, I like to trust people, but when there are incentives at play, which have perhaps accelerated over the last few years, those are going to shape people's behaviours in ways that are unconscious. This is not malpractice, fraud, deliberate, um, deceitful behaviour. It's simply that we can't rely on those norms to protect us against those incentive structures. And this assumption that science will self-correct. Again, in principle, that's true if we do all of the things that allow science to self-correct. But all of those things I mentioned, replication studies, publishing all of our results, including the less exciting ones, admitting that we're wrong, those things are not strongly incentivized within the current system. So I'll give you an example of what that looks like. And this is from my own field. This is work that I was doing or, or work that was related to work that I was doing when I was a postdoc 20 odd years ago. And this is a series of papers that were published, the first of which showed an association between a specific genetic polymorphism in the serotonin transporter gene and anxiety related traits. And then there were a series of other related literatures that grew from that that looked at potential mechanistic pathways by the human amygdala, the interplay of biological, genetic, and environmental factors when it came to the etiology of depression, all of which came together to present a really compelling case that this genetic variant was playing an important role in the etiology of depression with a mechanistic pathway operating by the human amygdala. And it looked great. And this was a, a literature that was doing a reasonably good job of conducting replication studies, publishing many of those replication studies. The problem was, as we now realize, that this was all a house of cards. And this um, blog post by Scott Alexander illustrates this nicely. And one of the lines in here, which I think is absolutely great, this isn't just an explorer coming back from the Orient and claiming there are unicorns there. It's the explorer describing the life cycle of unicorns what unicorns eat, all the different subspecies of unicorn, which cuts of unicorn meat are tastiest, a blow-by-blow -blow account of a wrestling match between unicorns and Bigfoot. No one was doing anything fraudulent here. No one was deliberately attempting to mislead the world in terms of these putative associations. This was research conducted by the standards of the time, if you like, in the context of this particular literature all published in good faith, with perhaps a few wrinkles to that that I can talk about afterwards if there's interest in that. But it shows how you can create an entire edifice, an entire literature, on the basis of what was effectively noise, 
Now, how do we know that it was noise? Well, the original study showing an association between that genetic polymorphism and anxiety was conducted in about 500 people. If you look at the study at the top there, which is a direct replication attempt, that was in 100,000 people. And there was absolutely no association in that sample of 100,000. So which are you going to believe? Finding reported in a sample of 500 people or a finding reported in a sample of 100,000 people? And when we looked at the gene environment interaction literature, we concluded that um, given reasonable assumptions, our simulations indicate that published studies are underpowered, they're too small. And this leads us to suggest that the positive results for the serotonin transporter serotonin, um, ser uh, uh, stressful life event interactions are compatible with chance findings. There was lots of evidence quite early on, and this, these are just a couple to illustrate that, but these findings were not robust. And plenty more since. But if you look at studies in indexed in PubMed that report on this genetic polymorphism, you'll see two things. First, I wouldn't say it's still going strong, but people are still publishing on this particular association, which we now absolutely know to be um, a chance finding in those original studies. But more importantly, you look at when those original disconfirmations were published, particularly the sample of 100,000 people that was published in, I think, 2005, you can see that the mass of publications occurs after that potential self-correction event. So why did people keep publishing when the writing was on the wall, at least as far as credible geneticists were concerned, much earlier on? And this is the point about science being self-correcting. Yes, ultimately it will. We know that this literature is um, the result of chance findings early on, coupled with things like publication bias and so on. But there was an opportunity for people to invest their effort elsewhere from as early as 2005, and they chose not to. And the reason they chose not to was that it was still possible to get that stuff published. And in fact, it still is, although there are fewer and fewer people pursuing this blind alley now, fortunately. So all of this on the right hand side is effectively opportunity cost time, resources that could be spent elsewhere, being focused on something that by that point was very clearly not going to get us very far. And actually, around the same time, there was a wider recognition that this approach to looking for genetic associations was not working very well. This approach of candidate gene studies where you identify a particular gene on the basis of known or presumed biology or neurobiology, identify genetic variants within it, and then look at those specific genetic variants that you've selected a priori, that candidate gene approach was largely generating noise. There are very few findings from that candidate gene literature that have passed the test of time and, and have been shown to be robust. But there was value in finding genetic associations, so how do we do it? Well, Mark Walport, who was um, the head of the Welcome at the time, decided that they didn't want to continue funding research that was producing these false findings. They wanted to capitalize on the newly emerging genome-wide technology that allowed for the simultaneous testing of half a million genetic variants, rather than the a priori selection of a handful to test directly. But how are you going to do that? If you're gonna be testing half a million variants, you need to be applying a, a correction for the number of statistical tests you'll be running. It was also becoming clear that part of the reason why these candidate gene studies were generating false findings was that the true effect sizes of these genetic associations was very small. Put those two things together, you're going to need very large sample sizes to be able to robustly detect associations. And the, the, the approach that was taken was one of collaboration. The Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, which by current standards, was very small, but by the standards of the time was transformative and very large, has generated ro results that are absolutely robust. So this is one of the first the genetic variant in the FTO gene that's associated with obesity, and that is absolutely nailed on. You go into any population-based cohort study and look for an association between this genetic variant and BMI, and you will find it, because it's there. It's a real finding. It's a real association. And if you look, you'll find it. And you don't need very large sample sizes. Now you know what you're looking for you will see that 
association. How do they do that? Very simply, by collaborating. To get the sample sizes that you need to detect those small effect sizes with a high degree of statistical stringency, you need very large samples. You can't achieve that within a single sample. Certainly you couldn't at the time. No one group had the data available to them to be able to answer these questions definitively, so they had to come together. You had to create this collaborative approach to be able to address this problem. That then also had some second order consequences that were positive. One of those was that if you're working in a collaboration, you need to be sharing data and code. And if you're sharing data and code, you need to be working in interoperable ways. You need to be working in ways that allow one research group to take your code and apply it to their data sets. You need to be curating your data sets in ways that allow for that uh, common use of code. And that fostered a culture of data sharing that still exists to this day. And also, you need to think about how you're going to recognize different contributions, because if you have these large multi-site collaborations, you have very long authorship lists. So you need to have ways of recognizing the individual contributions of individuals on those authorship lists, rather than relying on first, second, last, because if you've got 30 authors, then there are going to be 27 in the middle that miss out on that conventional recognition. So you need to have other forms of recognition. And in genome-wide association studies, even to this day, there's a kind of cryptic structure to the authorship list that reflects who did what, how much data they contributed, and so on. And so, in a sense, that story, and I gave the example of the serotonin transporter gene because it's one that was close to my own research, but there are plenty of others in the um, candidate gene literature that could stand in for that story. Seems like a negative one in that we put all of this effort into blind alleys, but actually turned out to be a much more positive one. Because what it did was facilitate this move to a much more collaborative way of working in the context of genome-wide association studies, to some extent necessitated by that new genome-wide technology that allowed for the simultaneous testing of half a million genetic variants, but also facilitated by the growing awareness that how we had been doing things simply wasn't working. And people like Mark Walport saying, we're not going to fund this way of doing things. We want you to do things in this more collaborative way. And so you get conclusions like this from a more recent review. GWAS findings are highly replicable. This is an unprecedented phenomenon in complex trait genetics and indeed in many areas of science, which in past decades have been plagued by false positives. It really did transform the field. And this is a literature that you can criticize it for all sorts of reasons, including the extent to which it's actually led to, for example, the discovery of new treatments for these different diseases. But the findings are robust. It is a much more robust literature than any other that I'm aware of, certainly. And I think that collaborative approach, that team working approach, that large scale multi-site uh, approach to research is a big part of the reason why it's so successful. And this is relevant in the context of these conversations about research culture, because I think you could argue that academia, both at an individual level and at an institutional level, has gone in the other direction, has become highly competitive and arguably hyper competitive in a way that people on the ground don't enjoy. People feel that pressure, that competition to publish, uh, to publish in certain kinds of journals, to win grants and so on. And that is antithetical to why you go into academia in the first place in many cases. But it's a part of the reality we find ourselves in. And so we have to either adapt to that reality or decide that academia is not for us. And I think part of the concern that drives this interest in research culture is that actually, if we don't get it right, we're not going to be able to attract and retain the people that make academia what it is. And you know, people don't go into academia to make money. Frankly, if that's your rationale, then you know, you've made a bad choice. But there are things that make academia valuable, good places to work, attractive places to work. But if we lose those, then what's left? Because we're not going to be able to compete on salary. So we need to create environments that allow people to thrive, that nurture people's careers, and that allow them to do their best work. So that's why you've been seeing all of these different things happening over the last few years. The Science, Technology and Innovation Committee had its inquiry into reproducibility and research integrity. UKRI has published its People and Teams Action Plan that is meant to allow for a far broader and more diverse range of principal investigators, including professional services staff, technicians, postdocs, and so on. And 
We've seen some of the early decisions for REF that have placed a lot more emphasis on people, culture and environment. And it's been interesting to see the reaction to that ranging from the very positive to from um, quarters where you might expect this much more resistance because downgrading outputs, which some institutions do very well at, is seen as a threat to, to them. But the motivation, I would say, behind this interest in environment and culture is that if we get that right, not only do we create environments that can attract and retain the best people, but also environments that encourage people's best work. And my argument would be that if you can get the environment right, if you can get the process right, then the outputs that we generate downstream of that will be right by virtue of having got the environment and the process right. And that argument comes from, comes by analogy with other industries. So we wrote about this back in, in 2014, and actually the idea came from Roby Blumenstein, who's the, the CEO of the CHDI Foundation, which funds Huntingdon's research in the US. And the analogy is this, that academic research is a bit like the US automobile industry in the 1970s. In the 1970s, cars would roll off the production line in Detroit and the quality control happened at the end of the process. Someone would check the output, count that it had the right number of wheels, check that the engine started, and that was it. The cars would drive off and lots of them would break down. I mean, you maybe some of you will be old enough to remember the, the era of the lemon, the irrede irredeemably badly built car that would just always break down. And no matter how many times you fixed it, it would continue to break down. It was a statistician, W. Edwards Deming, who took the concept of quality control in manufacturing to the Japanese automobile industry, with the idea being that you focus on the process, the manufacturing process, and you conduct spot checks on that process to ensure that the process is working well. And if you get that right, then you can trust the outputs to look after themselves. And that transformed the reliability of the Japanese automobile industry. It still has a reputation reliability today. The less intuitive insight that Deming's had was that by focusing on quality and getting the process right, not only do you improve the quality of the end product, but you also improve productivity because you're not investing resources in fixing cars that are broken down later. And if the analogy holds, by focusing on the research process, not only should that drive up the quality of our research outputs, but it should also mean because those findings are more robust, that we can more rapidly translate that knowledge into societal benefit, health benefit, and so on, because we won't end up going down blind alleys in the way that I described earlier. And so when we talk about research culture, there are different facets to that. There are the professional behaviors, both good and bad, leadership, bullying and harassment, managing risks, the governance frameworks that we operate within, the trusted research agenda, but there's also the research process itself. And that's where UK Reproducibility Network focuses its, focuses its attention and where we can take this analogy and see whether or not it does in fact hold in the context of academic research. But that approach that Deming's pioneered became known as the Toyota model. And the Toyota model had a number of principles shown here. And actually, if you look at those, that's not a bad starting point for a culture plan. So I think, again, we can learn from other sectors, but this idea that continuous improvement, respect for people, focusing on getting the process right, developing people and partners, and solving problems in the context of organizational learning, those are all things that I think we can be doing within academia without losing what it is to be academia, which is the key thing here. We don't want to turn academia into industry because we've already got industry. We want to keep academia as academia, but perhaps, look at how we can bring it into the 21st century and reform our culture so that we move away from this reliance in trust in individuals and develop a system, a process if you like, that is more inherently trustworthy and that people feel is there to support them. So it was those experiences, analogies that uh, led to the formation of the UK Reproducibility Network. We have existed as an academic collaboration since 2019, and we're still an academic collaboration. We don't exist as a kind of formal entity in any way, but we have a website, um, so you can find out more about what we do. And the network has three main constituent parts. We have local networks, which there's one here at Leeds Beckett, 
these are informal self-organizing groups of researchers that come together to form communities of practice on the ground, share best practice, find out about the pressures, challenges that they're facing, um, run journal clubs, seminar series, and so on. And many of these, but not all, are led by early and mid-career researchers. Then we have institutional members. Those are institutions that have formally joined the network by creating a senior academic role that is the institutional lead that works at the senior management level. And the model is that ideally every institution would have both of those because they serve different roles. One is the voice of the grassroots community. One is holding senior management's feet to the fire on these issues. And the two should ideally work in partnership, advocating for each other, challenging each other, um, with the institutional lead serving as a conduit for that grassroots voice to the senior management level. And then we have a, a stakeholder engagement group that comprises the funders, the publishers, and the learner societies. And what that structure allows us to do is to foster collaboration and to coordinate activity both within and between those three major elements. So we have a community of local network leads that come together for a retreat uh, once a year and, and who are kept in touch via our community manager. We do similar things with our institutional leads, again, creating fora for them to come together and talk about what's happening at their different institutions and share examples of um, challenges they faced and solutions they've identified. And we're bringing together members of our stakeholder group as well. But we can also link between. So, for example, when UKRI was setting up its um, Committee on Research Integrity, we were able to put a number of our local network leads directly in touch with UKRI to tell them what they felt were the needs of that grassroots community when it came to this committee that was being established. So very much about coordination and collaboration. This is a figure that shows where our um, local networks to the smaller circles and our institutional members to the larger circles are across the UK at the moment, although this is out of date already. The numbers are changing all the time. And in terms of the kind of key features of the network, it's very much a peer led collaboration consortium. The focus is on improving research through this collaborative approach to reforming culture and practice. And as I mentioned at the outset, although we started within the biomedical space, we're keen to be relevant across a range of disciplines, not least because one of our guiding principles is that there is a lot that we can learn from each other across disciplines. For example, one of the points I was making at the beginning was that we very much interpret our evidence through our own personal lens. And there are some disciplines, particularly in qualitative disciplines in the social sciences and humanities, that understand that positionality much better than your average biomedical researcher does, for example. So I think there's a lot that we can learn in, in both directions across range of different disciplines. But that's where we are at the moment, and we're growing all the time. This is a snapshot of our um, stakeholder engagement group, again, uh, somewhat out of date, but we have a range of different funders, publishers, learners, societies, and other sectoral organizations in there, including all of the constituent parts of um, UKRI, ranging from the Medical Research Council through to the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And perhaps most excitingly, we have a growing number of national reproducibility networks in other countries uh, modelled on UKRN, borrowing our, our terms of reference. This has thrown up some interesting um, philosophical debates. Luxembourg has joined as a national network where they only have one university. So can you have a network of one? We thought we probably could, so we let them in. Um, but also more relevantly, perhaps, uh, we have an African reproducibility network where the right level of abstraction there is at a continental level rather than at the country level, because individual countries uh, within Africa vary in terms of the resources available to them and their ability to set up their own independent national reproducibility networks. So um, the initiatives that are being led by Emmanuel Barake um, uh, within Africa are at that continental level to create that, that critical mass. And so the model is intended to be one that is flexible and can account for differences at an institutional level but also at a national level, because the requirements of different universities and different uh, different countries will vary. So we can't have a one size fits all model. But what that means is that we now have scope for a supranational dimension to that coordination and collaboration. And our strategy was always to start small with relatively modest funding and to grow the number of local networks and uh, institutional members and then as we were doing that to secure more substantial programmatic funding. And uh, three years into our existence, we um, secured, actually no, two years into our existence, we secured funding from Research England to set up an open research programme 
initially across our member institutions, but that has grown since as UKRN has grown, with the focus being on accelerating the uptake of high quality open research practices. So why the focus on open research? First of all, and this is Open Research Week, so this is very on topic, um, to do open research well requires some of those things that I've been talking about, coordination and collaboration. For example, we need to have infrastructure in place to support the deposition of different intermediate research object, data, code, images, source materials, and so on, on the principle that we should be making the work that we do as open as possible, but as close as necessary, recognizing that we can't always make our intermediate research objects entirely open. In my view, curated repositories work better than um, uncurated repositories. There are a range of different free resources out there. At the moment, the open science framework being one that allows for people to deposit their study protocols, plans, data, code, and so on. But in our experience, even though we've been sharing data in our research group for about 10 years, we still make mistakes because humans make mistakes. That's why we need to have processes that catch those mistakes and prevent us from being led astray. So having a team of professionals that check your deposit before it's published allows for those mistakes to be more likely to be detected. And we've had that experience where we've submitted something and it's come back to us and they've said, actually, this column could potentially be used to re-identify participants. Do you really need it in your deposit? Um, so we're fortunate enough in Bristol to have a curated repository with a data team behind it. Not every institution has that luxury or the level of resource to allow for that, which is why collaborative approaches might be a necessary part of the infrastructure piece of open research. We also need to make sure that people are given the right training to be able to engage in open research practice because different people and different disciplines are at different points along the open research journey. One of the things we're doing through the open research program is running a series of train the trainer courses with the idea being that institutions can send in trainers from their professional services staff or their academic staff um, at any kind of career stage. And on those courses, they will set up the workshops that they can then deliver back at their host institution so that those workshops are tailored to the eventual audience but set up in such a way that they share some key features with all of the other workshops that are being delivered across the country so that there's some common DNA, if you like, to how, let's say, data sharing is being delivered in these workshops across a range of different institutions. So flexibility to allow for that tailoring to a particular audience, but a degree of coordination and common approach. We also need to make sure that these things are worth doing there are lots of reasons to engage in open research from the moral to the pragmatic, but to get people to change their behavior, you need to incentivize it. Again, going back to that point about incentive structures. So one of the pieces of work that we're doing is looking at how we can embed recognition of these ways of working, assuming that we regard them as good ways of working, positive ways of working into things like our hiring and promotion criteria. So Bristol has introduced open research into its promotion criteria. And we have a piece of work across UKRN to try and um, harmonize that across our partner institutions because what we want to do is ensure that what is good for you in your career at one university is good for you in your career at the next university that you happen to move to and researchers are mobile which is why one of the key features of our open research program is this point about interoperability both through the train the trainer courses and through the work that we're doing on incentives to make sure that how you're trained the way in which you're supported to engage in those open research practices and the extent to which those are incentivized is coordinated across the sector because people will move, people do move, we want people to move across institutions and the more seamlessly they can transition from one institution to another, both in terms of ways of working and in terms of incentives, the better that is for all of us. And in my view, that open research and the transparency that is the kind of underpinning principle of open research is a large part of how we can move away from this 19th century model of trusting in individuals just because they happen to be a certain kind of individual and a very homogenous kind of individual to a culture that is more inherently trustworthy in part because it is transparent, because people can check what's been done in a research workflow, 
And I think that principle of transparency can be applied to any discipline. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But also more generally, that our ways of working as institutions can be made more transparent. So again, that fosters a sense of trust in the process so that we don't feel like there are key individuals who are making all of the decisions in a way that is opaque to us. And this is an example of what that looks like, again, in a, in a medical discipline. But what you have here are a range of clinical trials funded by the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute in the US. Year of publication is on the x-axis. And the little flag is the year 2000, because from 2000, that funder required all of its clinical trials that it funded to register their primary outcomes on clinicaltrials.gov. In other words, before 2000, you could run a clinical trial, and if the results for your a priori primary outcome didn't look great, you could promote one of your secondary outcomes with a better result, if you like, and call it your primary outcome in the eventual paper that you wrote, and no one would ever know. No one could check. After 2000, if you did that, someone could check. So the system after 2000 was simply more transparent. Someone could check that what you said in the eventual paper was in fact what you originally said when you designed your study. Before 2000, most of the studies reported a benefit for the intervention over the comparator, those the little pluses, and some of them were neutral, showed no difference between the intervention and the comparator. After 2000, nearly all of the studies were neutral, a couple showed a benefit and one for the first time showed harm. Now, this is a pre-post analysis, so we need to be a little bit careful about causal inference, but I would say on the left is what you get when you rely on trust in individuals. On the right is what you get when you have a more transparent and inherently trustworthy research system. And the reason this matters actually is that my own experience and the experience of many other early career researchers that I've talked to is that we experience the reality on the right because we can see our own denominator. We know how many experiments we've run. We know how many studies have not worked out the way that we want them to. What we see going on around us in the published literature, in what people talk about, is much more like the left. People talk about their successes much more than they talk about their failures. What ends up published is the good stuff that got small p-values and where the results worked out as expected. And that's really demoralizing unless you can somehow find out that the problem is not you, the problem is the literature or how open we are talking about what went wrong as well as what, what went right. In my own experience as a PhD student, my first experiment, which was replicating a finding that the published literature would have me believe was absolutely nailed on, that experiment didn't work, it didn't replicate. And of course, the natural reaction as an early PhD student was to assume that it was me and that was rubbish. And it was only because I was lucky enough to bump into a grizzled academic at a conference and said, oh, everyone knows that finding is rubbish. No one can replicate that finding. How was I meant to know that? It was only because I was lucky enough to bump into that person and resilient enough to survive the system that I got through to the other side where I realized actually everyone's reality looks more or less like mine. And it's the pub published literature that's the problem. So that transparency, I think, has benefits not just in terms of research quality, and the speed with which you can translate knowledge into societal benefit. It also has benefits in terms of looking after our researchers and making sure that they're not, um, they're not struggling in an environment that doesn't support them. So that principle of transparency, I think, can be applied to all sorts of things. Decision-making, hiring, promotion. I think we could get rid of the gender pay gap pretty quickly if we publish salaries, but that's the sort of thing that makes people feel very uncomfortable in this country. Um, but there are plenty of um, universities in the US where, you know, if they're publicly funded, their salaries are all on a website. So, you know, what, why don't we do that? Why don't we have the moral courage to just say, you know what, we're just going to make this stuff publicly available? I mean, I know there are, it's not quite as straightforward as that. But that principle of transparency, I think, is a good one to have in the back of our mind. Bullying and harassment is another example where the problem is not so much the process itself. Universities generally have quite good processes. It's that people don't trust the processes because they don't, they can't see how they work. They don't see the outcome of those processes. And again, there are sensitivities there. There are challenges in doing that well. But I think that transparency is part of how we build trust. And at the moment, I think it's fair to say that the sector as a whole is operating in a fairly low trust environment. 
where there isn't much trust at any level, and you're seeing that through some of the um, industrial action that's been happening and, and other uh, ways in which that's reflected, and channels of communication. You know, for example, making it clear how you communicate upwards and downwards and sideways across the institution, but also avoiding any back-channeling or subversive communication that allows a certain type of person who knows how the system works to be able to get in front of the decision maker. Just again, that principle of transparency applied more broadly. I think, I don't want to be too reductive, but I think transparency is a big part of how we can go about building trustworthiness. Of course, we need to do that in a way that doesn't turn research culture into yet another competition. And I know that Research England, with its greater emphasis on people, culture and environment, is acutely aware of the danger of turning research culture and people, culture and environment sections of re ref submissions into another um, into another competition. And I think that competitiveness is a large part of um, the problem, actually, the hyper competitiveness. But if healthy competition is OK, I have no problem with that. But uh, you can have unhealthy competition as well. And I think that has been acting against the trustworthiness of the system. So partly for that reason, we brought together institutions that received Research England's Enhancing Research Culture Club um, allocation into a series of workshops that allowed those institutions to share what they were doing. Not me. Um, and we put examples of what institutions are doing onto this catalogue that allows other institutions to go in and find out what everyone else is up to. Again, in that principle of sharing in a way that can foster healthy competition, I think, because you can see a good idea over there and go, oh, we want to be as good as them on that. So let's catch up. But also as a way of sharing best practice and in some ways or in, in some cases coming together to create that critical mass, particularly in, for example, regional clusters. And we ran when we ran these workshops, we ran them as um, regional clusters exactly because that physical proximity, I think, can also foster collaboration. So what I've tried to show is that there are a range of ways in which we can apply transparency to how we work. I think open research is one example of that and can foster improvements in research quality. is not coming from me. Even when I mute myself. So sorry, not sure what that is, but I'm nearly done, <laughs> which is the good news, I guess. Although I'm hoping there are going to be some questions. So what I've tried to point out is that um, I think we have a, a culture that stems from a now slightly antiquated model of what an academic is. I think we need to bring academia into the 21st century, to some extent, perhaps professionalize how we work, but we need to do that in a way that doesn't lose sight of what academia is in the first place. We need to make sure that we retain that. And one of the things that I think we can do at multiple levels of the system is just bring in more transparency in how we work, both in terms of the research process itself, recognizing intermediate research outputs, making our working available for others to scrutinize, to serve as a kind of quality control measure and an incentive for us to make sure that what we're putting out there is high quality. But we can also apply that principle of transparency more broadly to other aspects of how we work in terms of uh, organizational decision making, communications, and so on. Um, and ultimately, the reasons for doing this are both moral, that I think you know it's the right thing to do to create environments where people feel nurtured and supported and able to do their best work. But there are also selfish reasons to do that. If we don't do that, we won't be able to attract and retain the best talent, and we won't be able to achieve the success that we otherwise could as individual institutions and as a sector as a whole. And there are lots of things that we can do collaboratively that will benefit all of us. Not everything has to be a, uh, a competition. And if you like, a rising tide can lift all boats. Thank you. Again, thank, thank you so much, uh, Marcus. A lot of food for thought. I'll, I'll open up for questions or comments from the audience. At the back there, uh, Shanta. <laughs> um, um, 
But we really told you to look at this. Just think of these steps, this is the right thing to do. Do you think there are some people who might be keeping against the whole idea of transparency? Those who really need to take it. So I think. Um, one of the problems with the phrase open research is that it implies that everything should always be completely open and that's never really been the case because there are always going to be cases where um, you need to protect the identity of participants or there might be IP that you want to protect. So the phrase that's usually used is as open as possible but as closed as necessary and you need to strike the right balance in every individual context and that's going to be different in every different context. There may be differences um, across disciplines. So in more, uh, for example, creative disciplines, there more, might be more concerns around protection of, of the ideas, um, at least up until a certain point. I think most of those are solvable. So, for example, if you put something on something like the open science framework, you can set an embargo date so that it's posted at the point where you want it to be, but not made publicly available until a later date when you've done what you need to do to commercialize the IP or to get your paper published or whatever it might be. In the context of sensitive data, Bristol's repository has three levels of access, open, controlled and restricted. I always get those two the wrong way around. Um, where one, you have to request the data and if you look like a credible researcher, the data can be released to you. But at the highest level of access, the request needs to go via a data access committee and the data are released under a data transfer agreement. And there are all of the protections in place there that you would need if you were dealing with sensitive data where there is a risk of re-identification, for example. So I think all of these things are, are solvable. Um, and there may be cases where you simply can't make what you've done available to others. But I think it should be the starting point that, first of all, the work that we do is largely funded by public money or charitable donations. And so there's a, an argument that those who ultimately fund it should be able to access as much of our research activity as possible. There is also the, re, the argument that working in that transparent way um, encourages best practice. There's this great quote that, um, your most important collaborator is yourself from six months ago, and that person doesn't answer emails. If you curate your data so that anyone else can make sense of them, it means that you yourself, when you go back to them six months later, can make sense of them. Or the new postdoc that you've onboarded into your group can make sense of them quickly. So it creates efficiencies in that way. Um, it allows for more granular recognition. If you are the fifth author on a 10 author paper, but you produce the data for this figure in this paper, then that data set the code that goes with it can be specific research outputs with a digital object identifier that go on your CV. So there are lots of benefits to working in that way. And I think therefore that should be increasingly the default, always recognizing that there'll be exceptions. Is, uh, thank you, Marcus. That was, that was a very uh, interesting and thought-provoking talk. Um, I'll use REF as, a, as, as an example. Uh, so how do you how do you persuade a, a sector or a group of a sector to move in a particular direction if it's going to result in possible cuts in, in, in funding in, in the way a system may actually be you know, exist currently? Uh, why would it move? Why, what would lead to a cut in funding? Well, for instance, if in terms of the 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 changes in in outputs and and impact and and environment, um, some of the some of the the reasoning behind that, um, whatever that may be, may, may result in in a, an advantage or, or disadvantages for some for some institutions. Um, so, how do you, in terms of getting buy-in from, from from a sector or or, or across a whole sector or a subset of a sector that might that may have financial implications for an institution. How do we make that happen? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's an interesting one. I mean, it's a certain type of organization in, from what I've seen so far that is pushing it back against the ref recommendations on average. Obviously, there's going to be um, variation in that. Um, I, you do wonder whether or not that pushback is a sort of implicit admission that maybe we haven't got our cultural environment right, but I don't know. Um, inevitably, organisations will be quite conservative, and if they have done well in the past with the current setup, they won't want that setup to change because they know they can do well within that incentive structure. Um, but I think there are, the main argument is that you know the, the sector is not in a happy place at the moment, and we are struggling to um, increasingly struggling to attract good people to come and work 
within academia. I mean, that's certainly the case in my own institution and from what I hear at several other institutions as well. So if we don't get this right, we are increasingly going to struggle as a sector. And that sort of individualistic approach that focuses on what is to the benefit of the individual institution ultimately will lead to the whole sector struggling. We need to think much more collaboratively about this. I think the other thing that is interesting about the people, culture and environment stuff is that papers and monographs and the other kind of conventional research outputs are not the only thing that we produce. We produce skills and those skills are mediated by people, many of whom don't remain within academia, but go out into the wider world. And that's as much of a valuable output as an article in Nature, for example, or your journal of choice. So um, actually, again, we can be thinking of people, culture and environment as just another dimension of the outputs that we generate and part of what we think is um, a reflection of our wider excellence, if you like. And so if we can get that right, again, I think we should be able to bring the whole sector on in a way that benefits everybody, actually. that I don't think it needs to be zero sum in the way that a lot of institutions seem to be treating it at the moment. I've got a question here online, uh, Marcus, if I may. Um, the question is, what advice would you give to a PhD student or an early career researcher who wants to take these ideals forward in their career but may receive resistance from the established system? I would say two things, really. One is that early career researchers have a lot more agency than uh, an influence than the system would have them believe. I think there's something about the way in which academia works at the moment that creates a certain sense of learned helplessness at all levels, but particularly at early career level. But of course, you know, if you're an early career researcher working for a PI, if you don't do good work, then the PI suffers as well as you. So, uh, you know, they, they rely on you almost as much as you rely on them. And I think that's often lost. But the main point I'd make is that many of these ways of working are increasingly mandated by funders, incentivized by REF, open research practices are increasingly the direction of travel. The, um, the Horizon program, for example, that we are now part of again, uh, places a great deal of emphasis on open research practices. UNESCO has a whole open research um, program now that uh, entire countries are signing up to. So this is very much the, um, the direction of travel for the sector. And as a result, PIs are looking to bring those skills into their research group. So if you're an early career researcher who is able to not only curate data sets and code yourself, but also show others how to, you are actually making yourself much more employable because the simplest way for a PI to constitute their, those skills within their research group is to bring someone in who knows how to do it and show everyone else how to. So I think the the tipping point has been reached where early career researchers now have the opportunity to make themselves highly employable by demonstrating that they can work in these ways. And just to plug, we have um, a grassroots network here at Leeds Beckett University, very capably led by Dr. Sophia Person in psychology. So if you want to get involved, drop me or Sophia a line to, to get involved in the UKRN. And what I would say is that there is this um, question of what open research means to me in my discipline, what it looks like in a range of different disciplines. So we've done a piece of work led by Emily Farron at Surrey on open research across disciplines. And so on our website, you can find amongst our resources, which includes a bunch of primers to help people get off the ground in terms of open research practices. But it also includes a series of vignettes that describe what open research looks like in art history, in management studies, in psychology, in a range of different disciplines. And that's broadly structured along you know, assessment lines um, to, to map it onto the ref. So if you're wondering what open research would look like in the context of your own discipline, then there's almost certainly a vignette on our website that is in a discipline that is at least close to yours. To finish, may I once again thank Marcus for a hugely inspiring. I think it's given us all a lot of food for thought and, and Marcus is doing some fantastic work. Some of this we will be picking up in the events uh, throughout the week. So we'll have a short break now and then we'll carry on with uh, Dr. Alan Shaw from the Business School to talk about AI and responsible research. But from tomorrow, 